Hello, this is part one of a three-part mini-series explaining SEMG, what it is, what it's actually telling you, and how to use it in clinic. My name is Gabby. I'm a CPO with True Angle Medical Technologies and an adjunct assistant professor in the Communication Sciences and Disorders Department at the University of Alberta in Canada. And that is right here. All right, so... Let's get started. What is SEMG? Well, it start, stands for, pardon me, surface electromyography. Now you might go surface what, what? Surface electromyography. So it's a graph of an electrical activity of your muscles captured at the surface of your skin. Surface electromyography. Devices and sensors have many looks. I'll use this one as an example. It's an earlier prototype of our device. Now in our field, we typically deal with three sensors like this. One is a ground and it should go on something stationary like a bony prominence. The others are the active electrodes and they should go um, over the belly of the muscle of interest, preferably in parallel with the muscle fibers. So you can already tell from just the slide that placement of the device and sensors is important in the data that you're looking at. Now other sensors come separate from the acquisition or data capture box. This is what I'm used to seeing in clinic. Maybe it's something you've seen before. It's a sticker essentially with three sensors. We can't see the sensors here because they're facing the sticker backing. But what we can see is the three clips that are used to connect the sensors to the swallowing signal acquisition box. So what happens is once you um, detach this sticker backing and attach or adhere the uh, sensor sticker to the patient's chin, you will then use three alligator clips uh, for this particular example anyway, that then connect these sensors and the information captured from them to the swallowing signal acquisition box. Um, this particular box can have many different looks depending on which company you're uh, working with or which type of uh, technology you have in your lab. But ultimately, that information is then displayed to you visually in some way. Now let's look at the axis here. So on the x-axis you have time and on the y-axis you have signal amplitude in microvolts. Now clinically, you and I use this amplitude to denote the strength of a contraction. Um, but as we'll learn um, in a few slides, it's not quite that simple. Again, in clinic we may use visual biofeedback from uh, SEMG to get patients to swallow harder relative to a target that you've calculated, let's say, um, or even to sustain a contraction for a set amount of time, again, relative to a target that you've calculated. When we pl place the sensors, um, we place them under the chin, typically targeting the anterior belly of the digastric. So one sensor the ground sensor will go on the mandible if they're all connected like this. Um, that ground sensor can really go anywhere um, where there's a bony prominence, your forehead, your elbow, but in the case that um, I've shown you, the three sensors are connected together by that sticker. So, so the ground will have to go on the mandible. Um, and then the two active sensors go on the uh, at least in my case, the anterior belly of the digastric. However, these are surface sensors. They go on the skin. So you can see that there are a lot of muscles around here. And so probably what's happening is we're picking up some activity from the mylohyoid as well, the geniohyoid, the platysma. And so what does that signal mean? Well, the intent to move the muscle um, travels from the brain, as we know from the motor co cortex, down the upper motor neurons, spinal cord, lower motor neurons, ultimately getting to this little guy here that's called the motor unit. So I'm um, sure you're all familiar with this image from our bio 30, or sorry, that's here in Alberta, our bio grade 12 <laughs> um, 
And so what we're looking at here is a motor neuron connected to muscle fibers. So if we could see it, each of these muscle fibers has its own characteristic signature action potential called the motor unit action potential. So it's like a fingerprint, if you will, a fingerprint signal for that muscle fiber. Now, lo and behold, we actually can see it using what's called needle EMG. Now, this is quite a bit more invasive, um, a bit being the operative word. Um, so essentially what happens is you have a little hook um, needle that goes into your muscle fiber and you can see the action potential of that particular muscle fiber. So for instance, if I looked at this my muscle fiber, I might see um, a characteristic signal that looks something like this and another one that looks something like this and so on and so forth. But we're not doing that. What we're doing is we're collecting a sum of all these signals from a whole number of muscle fibers. Then that signal has to travel through fat, through layers of dermis, of epidermis, so that it can ultimately get to the surface of the skin where our sensor is collecting that information. So that signal is not just a sum of all these muscle fiber fingerprint signals, but it's also attenuated and dampened by the layers of fat and epidermis that um, lie beneath, between the, pardon me, between the muscle and the sensor. So if we think of each muscle fiber as a string on the guitar, each string has its own characteristic waveform. So something like this. But what we're detecting is a sum of many strings together. And to continue to use this analogy, if the guitar were covered with, let's say, a blanket or a pillow or whatever you want, that could attenuate the signal in many different ways. It could um, dampen some, it could bring some um, signal up. And so that's akin to you and I capturing muscle um, signal at the surface of the skin with our sensors. Join me next time for more on SEMG.